For the next 30 minutes or so, we'll be talking about topics like does service design exist in Greater China? Uh, how do we transform or reinvent design methodologies to fit the Asian culture? And finally, we'll talk about the differences and similarities between service design and business design. I'm Elaine Ann, and this is the Service Design Show. Hi, Mark Fontaine. Welcome to your two weekly burst of inspiration, where you get to learn what some of the world's best service designers are currently doing. We talk about the current state of the field, exciting new developments, and the challenges that are up ahead. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer so you can make a bigger impact on the world around us. We bring you a new episode every two weeks on Thursday. So if you haven't done that already, be sure to subscribe. My guest in this episode is Elaine Ann. Elaine is the founder of a consultancy company called Kaiser Innovation that helps Western companies figure out the China market. Elaine has a strong interest in the traditional uh, Chinese culture and uses that to reinvent design methodologies to fit the Asian market. Uh, Elaine is also running the IXDA community in Hong Kong, so she has a strong background within this field. Welcome to the show, Elaine. Thank you, Mark. Elaine, it's a, it's a pleasure to have you here. And like I said uh, in our chat before, I'm really happy to have more guests from Asia. So I'm really excited for our, for our chat. Um, Elaine. Thank you, me too. I'm really curious. Um, surf design is quite new in uh, Asia, uh, but I'm so uh, curious. Where did you learn about service design? What is the first time that you heard about the topic? Um, I actually grew up from Hong Kong and I lived in the U.S. for 12 years in the 90s. So I actually saw this whole industry develop. Um, and I actually, I think service design, the name didn't really surface until maybe six to eight years ago. Mm -hmm. But um, I was in doing user experience and you know before that it was called interaction design and yeah. before that it was called you know user interface yeah so i i was involved in the whole development of this industry and and now it's uh you know service design mm. so it's mm. really the channels and mediums that have changed and yeah. uh, do you remember so short, the, i've, the, I've yeah. learned it uh so it's do you remember, did you read about it somewhere or did someone point you on the topic? Where, where did the, the term service, where did you meet with the term service design? I think it really came about um, from the UK. Uh -huh. Yeah, from, um, you know, uh, maybe six, eight years ago, uh -huh. the, the term came up. Um, because I think that's where service design really developed, right? Cause, Absolutely, you know, yeah. Uh, UK is never n not doing manufacturing anymore yeah, yeah, <laughs> and yeah. not doing, you know, low level service job. So the, the, the industry has, you know, kind of have to move up for higher value chain kind of design. Elaine, um, you've sent me three topics that are really interesting and I've sent you a few question starters that you have near and we'll uh, go ahead and co-create the questions for the show for the next uh, 20 minutes, right? Sure. Are you ready? Yep. <laughs> so let me pick the first uh, topic uh, of this episode. And it's already uh, one I think that's really dear to your heart. And it's called Service Design in Greater China. Do you have a question starter that goes with this one? And can you hold it up? It's what if. What if so, service design is in Greater China? Isn't service design in Greater China already? Um, I would say yes, it is, but um, I think a lot of differences when service design is applied in mainland China or greater China. Mm. Yeah. And the reason is uh, because I have lived in the U.S. for 12 years, um, so I know how it's done over there. And coming back for 14 years and having my running my own business to help Western companies over here, um, I, I noticed that certain things are very different. Um, for Explain, what, what, what is the biggest difference? Uh, I would say um, <laughs> that 
uh, in Chinese culture, uh, this whole hi hierarchy um, in organizations, like you know, boss, manager, you know, um, there is a hierarchical, hierarchical order of um, of uh, command chain of command <laughs> mm. that. I think um, design, service design and innovation needs to happen in a flat culture, relatively. Because what happens is if you, as a consultant, if you work with middle management and, and middle management is never talking to top management at the same time, so you can be working in months and then suddenly be surprised. <laughs> when, mm -hmm. when, yeah. yeah. So, so the whole co-creation part of of uh, th th that we hold dear as service design community is really a challenge. It is to a certain extent a challenge, but we've um, innovated certain methodologies <laughs> to overcome that. Yes. Um, mm -hmm. Can you give an example? Um, for, okay. For example, um, I think in a hierarchical culture. Culture. Uh, of course, it depends on the type of business. If 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 it's more of a traditional manufacturing business, um, that would be very different from a internet business, which are composed of younger people. But l let's say we worked on the post office project, which is more governmental and, and uh, more traditional uh, management culture. Usually, the top management would only come into the meetings for like you know 20 minutes or <laughs> would open the show you know and then they'll go away and yeah. let the operational yeah. middle management people work with you but because it, it's very a very confusion top down culture that middle management always looks up to the top management for decision making <laughs> mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes they are guessing what the boss wants or they will choose uh, methods uh, choose um, solutions that are less risk taking or less like shaking the boat. Um, so, so sometimes like at the end of the day, when the top management sees that there'll be a huge discrepancy, you know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's, it's what I, we've experienced sometimes. But, it, but it, <laughs> the, the nice part about this is I think this also happens in the West, but maybe not as um, uh, exaggerated. Did you find that you said you've innovated uh, as methodologies and uh, do things differently? <laughs> Did you find some sort of solution, or how do how do you cope with this? Because if it, I think if we can learn from you, we can take some things back to the West because this also happens here. Sure. Um, is that the second question, or do we? <laughs> no, it's still the same. No, okay. it's still the same. But I. I okay. Um, for example, in a co-creation like workshop, uh, um, everybody has equal voice, right? Yeah. If you have a room full of um, executives and some are in management or positions or who is the boss and some are in operations, they will, the people in operations will tend to be very quiet or they do, do not, they will not want to say something that will get them fired. <laughs> <laughs> so, so a, so we've kind of uh, come up with a method called uh, anonymous post-its, meaning we'll have them all of them write it down. Uh, uh, we'll mix them all up. We'll post it on the wall. Nobody knows who said what. <laughs> okay, yeah, and then and then we'll get people to randomly talk about instead of saying who said this thing or who said yeah, that thing. Yeah, yeah. Nobody knows. Who and does said it work? That does it help? Yes, definitely. I think um, so. Okay. People feel like they, they can voice it, and also they're not pinpointed like who said what. So as as long as mm -hmm. the um, the feedback comes out, but people are not like put on the spot. Um, if you just say, yeah, "Oh, yeah, can you yeah. tell us what you think?" then people will feel that they're put on the spot, and they don't want to they don't want to be put on the spotlight <laughs> so much. Um, um, I think in the Chinese culture. Uh, Culturally, people like to be more conformist uh, because it's a collectivism culture instead of individualism. People would like to get mm -hmm. along, uh, be part of the group. Um, even if they voice something, they want to voice it in a very uh, smooth way. <laughs> so they're not challenging um, issues directly and pinpointing a person. Um, people mm, would take mm. it very personally if you say, mm. I don't like your idea, 
<laughs> you know, which I think happens yeah, in some yeah, Western yeah, cultures. Yeah. yeah, and people don't take it personally, uh, as personally. But I think, I think this that this is so recognizable also in our projects. Like I said, and maybe not in so much in an exaggerated way, but I think. This is this is why we do these episodes because I think we can learn so much from what happens in the Chinese culture and transfer the, in the interesting bits um, from that so. to here. But um, we're we're already diving into the second topic, so just let, let's I'll, I'll hold it up and um, let's continue with this one. And this one is already called Design Innovation Methodologies. Yes. Um, so I have how far, meaning. How far apart or how, how much difference is there between design methodologies, uh, you know, in the West and in, in like, greater China, for example? Um, I think... Yeah, because you learned the methodologies in the U.S., yes, right? In the US. So uh, what is your take? How far, how far <laughs> are they apart? I think in some ways, um, certain methodologies are quite far to the age group you're talking to in, in uh, China, for example. Um, for example, in the West, when we go to do like user research um, to understand a user needs, a lot of times, especially for American companies, we need to sign NDAs up front before we tell the user. And we also need to tell the user up front that they are going to be videotaped and do they agree with this, right? So all the mm -hmm. legal stuff mm -hmm. needs to be taken care of up front. However, what we discovered is, uh, I think in China, because people's trust is not is less based on the law, but based on people. The reason why they will let you in their homes. Relationships, yeah. yeah. It's all about the relationship. Yeah. It's not about the company. It yeah. doesn't matter if I'm working yeah, for yeah. This, this, this large company. It's, it's more about like if I'm this person's like classmate or family member. So the trust in the people. Um, so if you have them sign, try to get them to sign like a five-page NDA, they're just going to freak out. <laughs> and not even um, agree with the interview. Uh, yeah. So what we've invented is uh, something called a one-liner NDA. Um, so what we do is we build the rapport, we go to people's homes, we talk to them, um, and it's only after we see that they're comfortable and they trust us at the very end of the interview or home visit, we take out this one NDA, which has two parts. One part is the user agrees, uh, the company agrees to keep this information confidential. And then the second part is the user agrees to keep this information confidential. And we do it in the reverse, <laughs> right? We say we don't. Our company, our, our client doesn't want to, you know, uh, you know, let your stuff go public. And at the same time, we wish that you would also keep it confidential. So it's like a reciprocal mm -hmm. relationship, mm -hmm. which is what Chinese people are much more mm -hmm. used to. Um, so it's not like a one-way street. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and because it's one line, yeah, it's I simple to read. Um, yeah, people would say yes usually after that I, I, again uh, i'm sort of repeating myself uh, throughout this episode but uh, this is the empathy part that's so important within uh, the service design field and uh, from what i'm hearing from you it's much more important even in china than maybe in the west uh, right? yes yes i think in the west um it's like for example empathy is seen as us using this methodology study users so users are subject matters you don't have a personal relationship with them and you don't keep in touch with them however in china it's like the opposite <laughs> um sometimes if we go to people's homes it's actually better uh in some cases depending on the target group to bring them little presents instead of cold cash um and sometimes we yeah. need to go through a network of friends and family as a super extended network, which we have, um, to, to get the right people um, instead of cold calling a random database of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And I guess this is also recognizable, you know, the snowball methodology. I think a lot of service designers are familiar with that, right? You start with, uh, with the first 
uh, circle of people around you and then you work your way through to interesting candidates yeah. instead of cold calling uh, yeah. 200 people. And also because in China, <laughs> um, the whole China is using WeChat right now. Do you know WeChat, WeChat, the messaging thing? So each group in WeChat yeah. have a few hundred people. You don't see it on like WhatsApp or Facebook <laughs> messaging. Um, so mm. once it has a few hundred people, we can easily like send out the recruitment and be able to gather people from all different, um, you know, classes of people. And yeah, yeah that, that, that's like your first circle of, of uh, it's, it's your it's your network that, that helps you to get the right people uh, for research. Right. I mean, um, every, everybody has different groups. Like, for example, in the design community, we might have a group that is service design or um, user experience design or um, certain people. In So there are many, many different groups. And in each group, there are already a hundred, few hundred people. So we, we'll have to send it mm, to different mm, groups mm. to get the, the right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, or send it on mobile. All right. We talk um, so it... Yeah. yeah. Well, um... The, the, the question that comes to my mind is um, you have experience uh, with these methodologies from your own practice, but um, <clears throat> is there some sort of uh, online research resource, a website or a Facebook group or anything where people can learn more, you know, um, about these methods that I use in greater yeah. China? Um, I actually have written um, an article uh, a long time ago, <laughs> and uh, it's in the book about um, uh, it's a book it's in a book uh, on Amazon right now. So it's in the internationalization uh, chapter, uh, and it's called uh, mm -hmm. "Cultural Differences um, in Ethnographic Research Methodologies um, in China." Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I highlighted right. I highlighted. It Lighted, like why there is this difference because our culture is fundamentally different In the West it came from like Plato Aristotle <laughs> in China it came from Confucius right <laughs> in the West is more about individualism in China is uh, very uh, much about collectivism and harmony instead of sticking out and, and having your own opinion um, so this is so fundamental uh, in the way people interact and who to trust. For, for example, even companies like Airbnb, um, which is based on the model of sharing economy, which is based on the whole idea that, that everybody is in a community, right? But the Chinese yeah, fabric yeah. of trust is based on friends and family. And there's also a concept of in-group and out-group. So if you're not, so people yeah. are actually uncomfortable Lend, like having lease, leasing their uh, apartment to a total stranger, and that, that yeah, we base our trust based on on the number of reviews and that are uh, on Airbnb, right? That's that's the way we we take the trust yeah, these uh, days. But you know, for I think for Chinese people, if they if they if you're in the out group and you're not part of friends and family, they're like, why should I let you stay in my place? But if they trust you and you're part of the friends and family, they'll be like, then why should I charge you? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? That's... So, <laughs> yeah, yeah, so the yeah, whole, yeah. whole sharing economy model is based on, I think maybe the Western culture was developed in, in the past a long time ago, like the church community, church you know, communities that it, it came out from that lineage. Um, and people have more trust in strangers and also trust in the law. Um, mm, mm. but Chinese mm. culture, the whole unit is about the family. Um, you know, we have a yeah, hundred, yeah. uh, last names, you know, the Chan, the Lees, the, you know, that's, <laughs> that's how it came about. So, so yeah. people trust their own yeah. family. Um, you know, not necessarily even organizations, I think. Mm. <clears throat> Way, way, way too interesting uh, topic to actually uh, uh, move on. But I, we have to, we have to move on, uh, Elaine. Um, let's move on to the third uh, topic you um, you pointed me to, and it's called service design versus business design. And I think this is also very relevant 
yeah. to us. So why? Okay. Uh, yeah, so <laughs> my question is why service design versus business design? Um, I think the word service design, sometimes it's a little honed on to just service, but actually in an ecosystem of solution, there could be service. There could be hardware products. There could be software products. There could be mobile apps. It's really a whole big, you know, um, experiential design, right? Um, and also, uh, I think especially in Asia and in uh, China, uh, when you talk about service design, it's not possible, I think, to just design a service and not change the business structure, operations, and culture, which means mm -hmm. that we must have top-down buy-in. We must have the CEO um, um, buy, get into this. Um, and all the concepts of design needs to be implemented um, and, and bought in by the entire company to make it work. Yeah. I, I think that's not very different from what I've been experiencing in our mm -hmm. projects here. Um, um, but do you, but, and why did you raise this topic? You know, why, why, why is it specifically interesting to you at this moment? Okay, for example, I think in the West, um, consultants are viewed as experts where the bosses mm. would listen to the consultant's opinion as an outsider. Um, I think in Asia, uh, or specifically in Hong Kong and mainland China, it's slightly different. Um, what actually works better is if you are the professor or the teacher. A consultant can be viewed as a vendor. And... Uh, uh, so the attitude is the vendor executes and the boss is actually on the client side. But if you are a professor or teacher, you have a higher hierarchical standing. <laughs> right, and right. Your, your, your position is different. And I think uh, that's why in, in Hong mm. Kong and China we do training. Um, we, we do it in that, that way so that the ideas can get implemented afterwards and people have much more respect so so for instance do you <clears throat> position your own business as an uh, innovation consultancy or as a design studio or as a training <laughs> education yeah. facility okay. how, how do, how do you position yourself for western companies we are a consultancy for western companies <laughs> and we help them figure out uh, uh, the china market chinese user help them figure out the product market fit the strategy yeah but for in Hong Kong and China we're positioned differently we position ourselves as an innovation training company um, the reason is also because if you talk about first people don't understand what service design is um, when people think about service you think of the waiters in restaurants <laughs> or you know hospitality people in hotels um, that's what they consider service. Uh, secondly, the word, for example, design thinking is super confusing to people. Um, I think culturally mm. people think design uh, is about styling. It's about fashion design. It's about interior design. So if we use that word, it's just super confusing. Plus thinking and not doing, <laughs> it's even more confusing. So we have to return things like um, the work that, the work that I like um, is we would we would say hey, it's actually user or customer centric innovation, and that includes service, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that includes hardware mm -hmm. product mm -hmm. um, and service design, because people need to see results. Mm -hmm. They they want a term that leads because in businesses they 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 understand customer. They actually might not understand user, and they might not understand the word design, but innovation to definitely buy-in so yeah mm. so mm. in my company we never called ourselves a design firm because that would completely put us in the wrong it's always category. it's always about innovation you, you customer driven customer centric innovation yes because mm. if we say design people immediately think oh you do website design or you do graphic design yeah, yeah, and yeah, we're completely yeah. not on the same page yeah <laughs> yeah. yeah yeah well I, I i guess um 
again, this is uh, <laughs> this is an issue that has been raised all over the world. If I listen yes. uh, carefully yes. to uh, to all of my guests, but uh, <laughs> that, that, that's that's sort of the uh, uh, um, the baggage we have uh, for, that design has has put on itself uh, right yeah, now. Yeah, design is a very confusing word because it's both a noun and a verb, right? And yeah, anything yeah, is yeah, designed. Yeah. Uh, and you had, yeah. So, yeah. but I think we have we have to look at it from the business people's perspective. Um, uh, you know, plus, like, if you think about businesses, they are designing their businesses. Yeah. You know, yeah, whether yeah. they hire us or not. So, Elaine. Um, <clears throat> Elaine. Um, moving on to to my my final question. Um, in this this episode is what is the question that uh, keeps you awake at this moment so what is the question for instance you would like to ask the people watching this episode okay the question that I like uh, people to think about is when if companies are interested in Asia especially China because the market is so large is uh, the population is 4.5 times the US and and, um, I think a lot of people might not know that, um, you know, companies like Alibaba, their one day sale equals to the entire United States Christmas sales. And WeChat is already like 600 million users with 100 million outside of China. 600 million is the size of two United States. So like people might not even be aware of that. And if they are aware, then that means, you know, a lot of the economic activities is happening over here. Then we as designers have have to really understand. Look, so how do we design for consumers over here? Like, are they different? Mm. Um, you know, ha even the methodologies. Do we have to adapt it or reinvent it, or um, so that we can get better results or get better insights um, from from it to to innovate uh, new services or businesses over here. So how would you summarize your question? <laughs> I would say um, think about how um, innovation or design, service design methodologies works in different cultures. Yeah, I, I could, I mean, I'm most familiar with China, but you know, even for South America or uh, different, different cultures, how, how is it different? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Super interesting. Um, Curious what people uh, put your ideas in the comments of this uh, this uh, episode. So let's see what people uh, think yeah. about it. Elaine, uh, thanks. Uh, it was really inspiring, and I hope to have uh, many more guests from uh, from uh, Asia on on the show. It's really interesting. Thanks again for your time. Thank you, Mark. <laughs> what are your thoughts about the topics we've just discussed with Elaine? What do you think is needed to redesign design methodologies to better fit the Asian culture? Share your thoughts in the comments. The Service Design Show is all about helping you to become a better service designer by sharing real life stories from people that are currently shaping the field. If this is your first time here and you would like to see more interviews with service design pioneers, be sure to check out some of the past episodes. And if you haven't done that already, click that subscribe button. I'll see you in two weeks time for a new episode featuring Muna Aldaba, who will be talking about customer happiness projects. Make sure you don't miss that one. For now, thanks for watching.